that suddenly I've got this bug to write, like, you know. Well, when you say, it, it sounds very easy to say, I got this bug to write, but in fact it's... Well, it's, it's, I've it? quoted this before, but it's true, actually, it started through Bernard Shaw. Uh, I, he was alive in those days, you know, and uh, when he was alive, uh, it was always, uh, and every day there's some quote in the paper by him, and I thought it was a comic like Tommy Trinder, you know. I was sort of played him or something, I thought I must catch his act sometime. And, and I was in Cadden Town Public Library one day, trying to uh, find a book to read, and saw all his books by Bernard Shaw, and I thought, Christ, he writes as well, like, you know. I went home and started reading them, and it changed my life completely. And after, what did you do then? When you say it changed well, your life? Well, then I sold my drone and bought a typewriter. I thought, I thought for some reason, I thought, oh, I, I want to write too, like, you know. Well, up until then, I, 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 it, well, after reading the show, he proved to me that it doesn't matter what, where you started from, you could be anything you wanted to be, or you could try and be it, you know, and, and um, um, background or, or birth didn't matter, like, you know. Johnny Spade, Cockney scriptwriter, the man behind the comedy series Till Death Us Do Part, also the man behind one or two uproars when his idea of working class life offended viewers from all classes. But he should know what he's talking about. His father was a scaler in the London docks and he left school at 14, started his literary career by selling jokes to comedians at seven and six a time. Now he's a success, drives a Bentley, owns a big house in London's stockbroker belt. He's also something else. He's part of a new design for success, the fashionable style for today's top people. The talent of a designer like Alan Aldrich has brought him to the top at 25. He's put his mark on book covers, refrigerators, shoes, even op art E-types, and girls who want to go to parties in transparent plastic dresses with only a pattern between them and the law or pneumonia. He's a Cockney who married one of the counter ladies from a London store. His father was a clerk, his friends are clerks, and ten years ago he may not have made it to the top. Leading designers were always well spoken then. But today, his working class background appears a positive advantage. He's encouraged to exaggerate it, fawned over because of it. Perhaps it helps the rest of us believe we really are becoming a classless society. The fact that Aldridge is admired artistically is perhaps less significant than the fact that he's lionized socially. His work is copied by anxious to join in other artists, but it's his accent that is sometimes mimicked by equally anxious old Etonians. For those among us suffering the disadvantages of middle class or upper class backgrounds, he's very much to be envied. We too, it seems, would like to be working class, WC people. For Aldridge, what are the material rewards of success? Does he own a big car, a wardrobe full of clothes? Uh, no, I buy all my clothes from Alfie Kemp, second-hand wear store in Camden Town. Uh, I've never paid more than two quid for a pair of trousers. Uh, I like boots. I'll pay anything for a reasonable pair of boots. Uh, the sweater I'm wearing now I picked up when I was hitchhiking in Holland seven years ago from a sailor. I swapped it with a... This isn't a dirty story. I swapped it with a sailor for something. Uh, um, no, I think to be able to buy a house, I bought a house uh, and set my wife up. You know, it's got a little happy kitchen. And we've got a little boy who's got a nice place to, to grow up in, you know, and it's a sort of fun house. Um, to be able to do that is uh, Haven't you bought rewarding. a best suit or something? I did. I looked such a twit in it, quite frankly, that I uh, gave it to my young brother. But, uh, you know, one buys a good stereo kit. And if you want to, you know, I have a passion for books. If I want to buy 10 quid or 20 pounds worth of books, I can walk into a store and buy 20 quid worth of books. Same as records. I'm a mania for records and go into Imhoff's uh, and sort of stack records up and just show my little card and walk out. I think it's fantastic, you know, and always imagine it's free somehow. It never occurs to me I'm actually paying for them. Because, you know, you get these credit cards and accounts everywhere and you just sort of walk in and knock off stuff. Mm. And, uh, Do you run a car? No, I can't drive. I had a very bad accident a couple of years ago where I told enormous lies to the police and got all very involved and got taken to court and prosecuted on eight counts and it sort of taught me a lesson. I've not been in a car to drive since, but my wife has had uh, 75 lessons at 30 bob a go up to, the, up to uh, this coming Sunday and I'm hoping she'll pass pretty quick.
How many times yeah. has she tried? She hasn't gone in for it yet. <laughs> it's crazy, you know, every Sunday she gets called for and I'm beginning to think there's something more in it, quite frankly. But uh, every Sunday this very smart man turns up in a car and drives her off. But do you think that people attempt to lionise you and make your society pet now that you're a success, almost because you're working class and a success? Probably, I suppose so. Also, working for Penguin, the um, majority of people at Penguins have a very high academic background, university, which I never had. And one does feel a little bit self-conscious when you start chatting to editors and they're rambling long words off, you know, and you vaguely understand them. Well, you certainly try during your working day, perhaps to be less cockney and a bit more uh, highbrow. Uh, but when I meet someone like Chris Stamp, who manages The Who, I mean, we get together over a table. Well, it's about two minutes and I've really gone right back and, you know, all the cock cockney language is coming out and, uh, you know, it, that again is unconsciously, I don't know why, you know, it starts rolling out and four b twos and apples and pears and all this, you know, it's just an unconscious thing. Uh, what do you do about this situation of long words that you don't understand? If you, have, you presumably right, have yeah. to have business <laughs> discussions in which people therefore do use a whole language that you don't understand. How do you yeah. cope? Well, I think they, they talk about it long enough and you, you grasp what they're on about. I mean, I, had, I don't want to sound too thick, but iconography was a word thrown at me the other day. Well, I knew vaguely what it meant, I mean, but I let the guy rabbit on and talk and talk and talk and I mean in the end he sort of virtually spelled it out for me and I understood it. he probably thought I was very thick. Do you think some people who like yourself come through to success from an ordinary background with ordinary speech deliberately make themselves working class because they found that it's become fashionable to be a working class success in this oh, business? Oh I'm sure they do. I'm sure that uh, um, you know the Bailey image rubbed off on a lot of people and one was meeting all sorts of cockneys with uh, rugby school ties on for a long while. You know, I think certainly uh, I presume last year was the year of the cockney or the year before, I forget which it was now, Bailey Stamp and Duffy were all um, sprouting with the cockney lingo, you know, and getting in the press. Um, I've not had that sort of problems only once with the Daily Mail, you know, that said I was, you know, young lower middle class boy making good, which I find by me, but uh, I've not, you know, I've met Snowden and Robert Carrier and, you know, I get on, I don't change my style of voice, I get on with them fine. They have a respect for your talent and want to meet you. Uh, one often gets invited to dinner parties. I mean, when I told my mum I'd been to Kensington Palace, she nearly fell apart, you know, and once I answered the phone and someone said, this is Elizabeth, I want Tony, you know, <laughs> I thought it was all a joke, really, but it was real, you know, it was quite funny. And um, once I cut up uh, some photographs on a 14th century Japanese table, which didn't please them too much, but uh, apart from that, I think I got on with them quite well. Were you nervous at all in a situation like that, about how you ought to behave? No, I were, I were, when I met them, I went up with a, uh, an art critic, um, who went up to introduce me, and I was so staggered to see these sort of newspaper images standing there. But I just reacted as I'd react to meeting Bert the Fisherman, you know, and I sort of said hello, and looked round to see this bloke sort of prostrated on the floor, you know, and he was saying, mom, mom, you know, and I couldn't believe it. But of course, his background was entirely different to mine. He was upper class, um, private school and all this, and of course had a tremendously different attitude to royalty than I did. I mean, to me, their newspaper images and people who uh, have birthdays that you have to remember, etc, etc, but nothing to idolise when, of course, this man sort of fell apart and every time he was asked for a cup of tea, he was, yes, your Royal Highness, you know, and I was saying, yes, please, I am. You know, I mean, just acted normally, really. Do you think that your wife ever worries that success will affect your marriage? What, to right be deep normal? down inside, there must have been some Oh, sure, there's a, a slight apprehension, because whenever someone, either a pop singer or a film star has a divorce, you know, she always quietly points it out to me and sort of say, you know, are you thinking about this any time? There's a sort of a unconscious sort of underlying fear, I suppose, of uh, that I'm meeting lots of model girls and all this and 
going to leap about with them and ruin my marriage, but I mean, it so far it hasn't occurred to me. Might it? I shouldn't think so, no. Why not? Uh, well, I think because I'm, you know, super comfortable at home, I, I like working, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine the type of girl that could break my marriage up, you know, I just couldn't imagine it because I get good food at home, comfort, loving wife, nice nipper. Mm. You know, I, I can't think what would ruin my marriage. The lush life at the top in the public eye can make private behaviour vulnerable and perhaps the WC people are more vulnerable than most. All their affairs become our business. Sandra Goodrich, daughter of a welder from Dagenham, is now top pop singer Sandy Shaw, earns a thousand pounds a show and represented this country in the Eurovision Song Contest. She now can choose between social invitations from people who'd never heard of her when she was a punch card operator. Her song for Europe was called Puppet on a String, and pulling the strings behind Sandy Shaw is her agent, tough, realistic, protecting an investment. She sorts out the invitations. That's right, Sandy and I invited all over the place, and we just don't go because we think we're all stage struck. In fact, the Duchess of Bedford wrote to you and asked you to go to the big ball in Paris or something. Well, she couldn't go because she, she was working anyway. couldn't go anyway. because Princess Margaret asked me the week before. <laughs> No. When she was at the Savoy, what's his name, wrote Robert Morley and James Mason. And, and what's her name? What's James Mason's daughter? Portland. Yeah, yeah, it's Portland. Yes, and she came yeah. round and she says, she actually adores Andy. Oh. Rather nice than James. His daughter daughter. And Robert thought she was rather lovely. Who else came round? What's his name? Uh, Jocelyn, um, our mate. Oh, you know Jocelyn. Jocelyn Stevens. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they wouldn't have put me on the front page of Queen, would they, a couple of years ago? A couple of years, a couple of months. No, so a couple of years ago, they would never have oh, put yes, me on the front right, page sorry. of Queen. Oh, yes, that's right, sorry. Absolutely. But they wanted to have you to a party or a dinner? Yeah. Why do you think they did? Because she's Sandy Shaw. Can you just imagine them inviting her when she was in Ford's factory in Dagenham? You know, full of those tricks. Mm. You oh. think I'm very hard, don't you, but I'm not. She's bringing me down. No, I'm not bringing you down, because you no. know it's the truth. I'm not hard, yeah. believe me, I'm not. I find it quite enjoyable being with these, these sort of, like, snobbish people. I mean, it's like a game they play, and you sort of play with them. It's quite enjoyable. Suddenly they sort of become very honest with you, and you become honest with them. Then it's sort of like you're the same people. Mm. But I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of go to one of these parties unless I was completely relaxed, and as long as I wasn't tired, as long as I was full of the sort of like joys of spring, then I would go. But if I was depressed, I wouldn't want to go to one of these parties, to, you know, to cheer myself up because it's hard work. Why is it hard work then? Well, to sort of like try and break the barriers for them because these people they're so they don't speak they're the same embarrassed. Language. Yeah, they don't speak the same and language. And you have to help them to talk. They can't talk to you. They don't know what to say. They've nothing to say really. A mantelpiece photo in the back parlour of a working class London home. This is where Twiggy lives. Only Nell Hornby, Twiggy's mum, still calls her Leslie. Is life with a famous daughter difficult? No, I don't think so. I, don't, I just don't look for it, you know, I just don't notice. I don't, like, I went to Selfridges the other day, there's big photographs of her there, in the wig place, you know, and I was having a look, you know. And um, the young lady come up to me and said, um, are you interested in a wig scene? So I said, no, what's the matter with the one I've got, you know, <laughs> the real one? <laughs> and I was looking at Leslie, actually. I never said anything. I don't mention it, you know. Why not? No, I don't be embarrassing, really. I would have Just thought of <coughs> that, Mother. You'd have been proud. No, I am proud, but I don't sort of... Um, no, I, I just don't, I just don't, you know. I don't tell people who's, who I am or... Unless they find out, I don't bother. I don't tell them. But why not, really? I don't know. It's just um, I don't like to, you know. <laughs> I don't like. Uh, um, I just rather keep in the background, sort of thing, you know. Leslie in the foreground, nat uh, naturally. But I don't like to um, sort of um, tell people if they know. Well, if they know, but if they don't, I don't tell them. 
Twiggy, at 17, owns the small back bedroom in her parents' semi-detached at Neesden, the body of a half-starved boy, the eyes and the mouth of a woman-to-be, and the almost automatic right to be today's face on the front cover of nearly every magazine in the world. She's still a cockney sprig with a mini-bosom and three pairs of false lashes on each eye. She spends her ten pounds a week pocket money mostly on sweets, and it hardly seems extravagant if you consider that she earns twenty pounds an hour when the cameras are clicking. Her life is ruled by her agent and friend, Justin de Villeneuve, who's also the lodger at home. They're nice people, new to success and adulation, but happy and innocent in the way they handle it. They're very definitely WC people. Oh, oh, I can read the Arab Arabic. Hold on. Thank you to your Jabal's University of Riyadh. Dear my, my, my dear, dear girl, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I have little doubt that someone sends you cuttings of all these things, but it did occur to me that you might have not seen this. This is a picture from the front of our Hayat, a Lebanese daily paper. Where's Le 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 Lebanon? Lebanon. Where's that? An Arab country, Dopey. That's the president, isn't it? Is it, is it I'm not sure that it is on the front page, oh. but Arabic reading from right to left. It looks as if it's on the back. <laughs> I don't quite honestly think that the picture does you justice, as you are far more appealing. Ooh. Does it say that? <laughs> if you did come here, it would be quite unforgettable, both for the Saudis and for you. Sure, Mum. Oh, will you remember to take my shoes in? And give the things to the cleaners? Say. Oh, we try and get those body stockings as well. Today's teenagers can identify with Twiggy. Half of them already look like her. The dream of the handsome young escort and the fierce white sports car is somehow more possible when you can remind yourself that even if you don't have the money, the important engagements and the fame, you too are one of the WC people and can perhaps one day make it to the top. That's <laughs> Barry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Nobody seems quite sure of where Malcolm Muggridge sprang from. It doesn't seem possible that there was a time when we didn't have him around. Anyway, today Twiggy takes her place alongside him in wax. He'd be bound to have an opinion about her success, only she didn't ask him. Okay. Shall we take your coat and if you sit down there? The whole thing's a bit like going to the dentist, I'm afraid. It's all a bit clinical and convict and that sort of thing. Yes, fine. This is Jean Fraser who's going to do the sculpture. How do two swords measure success? Decide that a girl like Twiggy might last? Well, an awful lot of people choose themselves, we find. When you go in and see the managing director and we... Suddenly we find we're both talking about one person and we say, gosh, it would be nice to do that person. And then you wonder if they'll last or whether they're just going to be out in a month's time. And these figures cost quite a lot. You're talking about £700,000, something like that, to do a figure. Yeah. And so you don't embark on it lightly. You want to get three or four months out of it if you possibly can. At the least, we reckon every figure that's going into this area we're doing Twiggy for should last for at least four months. And we hope that some of them might even last two years. It's a problem. You never know yeah. how long they're going to last. As we call this medical. <laughs> what sort of standards or rules can you ever use to decide that somebody might be here to stay? Or we make mistakes. It's a, this is a, this is a chance, uh, as with anything. I mean, you're bet it's like betting on a horse. We're we're perhaps fairly slow and deliberate about the thing, mm. and we wait as um, we wait as long as we dare. But if you leave it too long, the story is gone. I mean. Do we do Frit Francis Chichester now, or do we wait till he gets back? Past 30 and a half. <laughs> Why is 24? Hips. Hey? Eh? 33. Yeah, 33 is right. Oh. Uh, now we've come to the end of that, so we want to do the pose. Mm. Which we want to be sitting, something rather like that. Oh, yeah, it's going to be sitting the, down one. Yes, as if you're the cover of a magazine. Yeah. The face that symbolises, perhaps, what it's all about. On the other hand, the rag trade at least knows what to do about it. 
Twiggy is big business. That's got some things. They don't fit me though. That's pretty though. Not too strong. This one is going to win a right the way through for obvious reasons. It's safari styled without going to extremes. On the back of the vertical piece to correspond with the contour style. That is usually one of the color highest that occurs in red. It's optional. Hand up. Bring your hand up to your chin. Your hair's going back again. Come on, straighten your hair up. And learn to profile that way. Good. Well, drop the elbow a little bit. That's very good. That was good. Twiggy, very good. Yeah. What actually happened? I had a verbal not a contract, a verbal agreement, but I made it quite understood to him that he would have to have approval from my financial advisor. And the terms of the offered level on paper aren't acceptable. I think he sort of pre-sold the film to them. And um but you didn't don't get upstage it. me. Don't upstage me. Oh. And uh, <laughs> it feels a little bit messy. Just brush it down on one side. Come on. Do you have many clothes uh, of your own? This is a, a new suit. This is for what, this suit? For, uh, it's for my American trip. Oh, it's great. To be a little bit different. No, I, I, I haven't got such a large wardrobe. No. 30 suits. <laughs> 100 shirts. Yeah. Oh, it's cool. What is it? Uh, Worsted. Yeah, but all that little bitches are no fashion. Justin, you were saying that you were taking somebody called Teddy the Monk, is it, to the stage here? Yeah, Teddy, he's a flower seller in Knightsbridge, and uh, funny enough, he's done about six films for Canadian television. They, they call him they the call King of the Road. He's a pure copy, and he's hysterical. So I'm taking him as my chauffeur just to send everybody up because, you know, he's just incorrigible. He's an outrageous. You must yeah. know him. But, but you know, Knightsbridge night 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 call now on the station. Mm -hmm. Oh, you use the next time you pass that lunch. Maybe I don't know all the in people or something. <laughs> no, he's not. He's just lovely. No, he's super. His name You'd is know Teddy Adams, but they call him Teddy the Monk. And he's going to drive you around in America? Yeah. He's going to be my... How does he feel about being your chauffeur? Oh, he's great. He's very excited about it. You know, and uh, it should be good fun. No, because he's a very dear friend of mine anyway. I've known him for years. And, uh, you know, Twiggy be working during the day, so I need some people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that he, uh, as a pure cockney flower salesman, would be uh, more effective in the United States as your chauffeur well, uh, well, than a proper professional well, chauffeur? Well, um, the Americans like a show, and it's very important, and it's very good prestige-wise for our image to arrive with a chauffeur. I mean, the Americans dig this, and apart from that, he's a great character. And, uh, you know, I feel that really we're putting on a little bit of a show for them. Do you feel out of place as a success because you started from ordinary working class beginnings? No. No, why should I? <coughs> 10, 15 years ago you might have done. Oh yeah, I would have done, definitely. But I think, you know, 10 to 15 years ago I'd never been a model, you know, because the look, they were v very beautiful women and you know, I wouldn't have had a chance. But I think the look's completely changed now. And the Beatles broke down the barrier, you know, the class barrier and all that. I don't think it really matters what class or family you come from. If Let you're good ask. enough in your job, you know, you make it anyway. Let me ask <coughs> you, Justin, have you found that it's somehow kind of fashionable these days to be I not just a success, but to be working class with it? I, th I think it's a distinct advantage to be working class, to have a working class background and become successful. And especially internationally, in America, the continent, they love this. <coughs> you know, it's most definitely an advantage. Yeah. What particular examples can you give me of that? Michael Caine, Terry Stamp, The yeah. Beatles. What happened to you and Twiggy that proves the point, for instance? Um, up until about two years ago, 
as close as that. Um, somebody with Twiggy's background just wouldn't have had a chance in modelling or in the fashion business. And I think Jean Shrimpton brought in a new look that we owe a lot to Jean Shrimpton. And then I think um, she was sort of a launching pad for Twiggy, who now has a fantastic following of teenagers who identify themselves with her because she was at school a little while ago, and her background, which is closer to them than, say, Baroness Tyson, who's a very successful model. There's more of an identification, and it's because of this and what the Beatles did. I, I think we can say Twiggy is sort of a mini queen of the new social aristocracy, and it's... <laughs> <laughs> Ah, this is true, and the Americans, they love this. She's the biggest thing since uh, <laughs> Hot Cross Buns in America. <laughs> is this? No, no, hamburgers. You are therefore deliberately working at promoting a working class image. Oh, most definitely. I come from a much poorer family than Twiggy. I mean, I'm most definitely working class. I've had three name changes, <laughs> and I want to change my name back now. <laughs> because Justin de Villeneuve... De Villeneuve. Uh, yeah. It's a very aristocratic name. It's hardly a working well, class well, well, name. Uh, it was, it's hardly working class. When I was John Davis, and I became Nigel Jonathan Davis, then I became Mr. Christian for a while, <laughs> and then I became Justin de Villeneuve because I went into interior decorating. It's quite successful, actually, and it was a distinct disadvantage five years ago to be old John Davis as a designer, whereas <laughs> things have changed so much. But I'll have to change back a bit. I can't really, because I... But, uh, it was part of the plan. Therefore, for, it's important, I would have thought, that you maintain the ordinary accents and way of speaking that you have. Um, well, well, Twiggy hasn't changed her accent. What about your own accent? <coughs> it hardly uh, betrays your working class beginnings at that. Um, no, um, I think with the present image that I've developed, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't very well speak like Terry Downs, you know, who I adore. But I feel that, you know, he's, he sort of gives the public what they want. If I think he's a fabulous character, because he's very, very honest. But, I mean, it wouldn't be any good for me, because for, for the way I operate, it would be a little bit silly. But certainly, when I get to New York, and I get off that plane at Kennedy Air Airport, I'm dropping all my H's. <laughs> <laughs> Almost certainly. I'll have to pick you up when you don't drop them. Yeah. Like you used to pick me up when I did. <laughs> Well, it's a normal scallop, but it's a got... A veil? Yes. Yeah. And it's got a sort of a Provencal sauce. What's that? Well, it's made with... Uh, yeah. Onions, tomatoes... It hasn't got wine? No, no. No wine at all. I'll try that. Later. It's well, not you know, enormous, though, the veil, is it? Because I'm not very hungry. No. Well, I'm hungry, but, you know... I'll have a fillet steak. Medium. And your spinach, not cream spinach. Pitch white, silver clay. That's it then, isn't it? 